feet at a time and I'm taking a pause pause it for a second while the boat pulls it along that way we don't get our bait tangled up when we're dropping it okay yeah I'm at 1200 here on this do that three or four times we keep the bait moving up and then once we do it three or four times then we'll start bringing the bait back down we'll go a color down leave it there for 10 or 15 seconds another color down 10 or 15 seconds another color down 10 or 15 seconds and then we'll find the bottom again and restart the whole process the bite with this is very subtle it's 
most of the time you don't see anything but just a little movement in the tip of the rod and a little tiny fish might make a little movement in the rod or a great big fish might make just a little tiny movement in the end of the rod sometimes they just bite it and go away with it but you can't really judge how big a fish is going to be off of the bite we have a attached to the bait we have like a 12 odd hook that has eight foot of 400 pound leader and then we have 200 pound leader that's about 100 feet long that goes to a dacron loop and uh, our weight is going to be about 100 feet from the bait and we're going to have uh, two lights on the line the first light is going to be about 20 to 30 feet from the from the bait and the next one's going to be about 50 or 60 feet from the bait and uh, it's very important that you use monofilament and not fluorocarbon for your leaders the reason being because down there in the deep like that we have these lights on there and the fluorocarbon actually acts like a fiber optic cable in the darkness down there when that light shines the fluorocarbon will carry the light all through the line whereas the monofilament will not so you, you want to use your, your monofilament leaders out here on the daytime sort of fishing on the bottom we're hooking our fish at about at about 20 to 25 pounds of drag. Remember, we have a five pound weight down here on the bottom. We're hooking our fish at about 20 to 25 pounds of drag, and then after we have the fish hooked up, we're going to go ahead and back the drag down to about 15 pounds. Definite bite, but not a, like a return, you know.
o'clock. And we got a nice one on the deck over here. And uh, we're gonna crank our stuff up and take this one in and go weigh him and see what he weighs. So to me, one of the craziest things about that fish is that the fish has another rig in its mouth, and the rig is very recent. Somebody very recently hooked this fish. Somebody very recently hooked this fish and broke it off. to weigh this 160 pound swordfish. Zero. Zeroed out. I don't know whether he's going to be worth anything in the tournament, but he's definitely going to be good to eat. Actually, 150, 200 to what? I think he's probably going to be around 160-ish. <laughs> 150 to 4 152.4 pounds All right, so what we have here standard run of the mill 150 pound swordfish I'm going to clean this thing up real quick This thing is super simple to clean they don't have any bones that are in them, so basically, I'm just gonna run the knife all the way down. I'm gonna make an outline. This is Let's not our to. rig. This. I don't know who did this, but somebody was fishing with the circle hook. This is a 12 watt circle hook. This was not our rig. This fish was hooked right in the corner of his mouth, and what had happened was, was somebody hooked this fish and was fighting him. The line got wrapped around his bill. And it cut off. off. Yeah, it was very short. That was somebody else's stuff. We caught him on a much more unlucky day for him.
stick in them, and they have very few bones. So one of the reasons why they are so commercially desirable is because that quickly on a 150 pound fish, I have this beautiful 60 pound fillet. <laughs> nice. That's great. Flip the fish over. I'm also going to show you how to preserve the bill. swordfish they live down super deep in the water but because they live so deep because they live so deep in the ocean they cannot have a skeleton they were to have a skeleton, the skeleton would get crushed by the pressure that they live in. Being so deep. The fish was cleaned in, I don't know, two minutes or something like that. It's got a spine here. There's a couple of bones right there. There's a couple of bones right there. But other than that, those are two big, full, boneless fillets. Now I'm going to take the bill off. A lot of people try and make a mistake cutting the bill right here. That's not where you cut the bill off of a swordfish. You cut the bill off of a swordfish behind its eye. Nice. Perfect. So now I'm going to take this and soak it. You don't put it on an anthill. You don't do anything with it other than soak it. And what will happen is, is I'll put this in the water. I'm going to leave it tied to a rope. And while this thing's tied to a rope, this flesh right here will deteriorate and the bone that comes out right here will separate from this bone right here and after a couple of days I'll lift this thing out of the water and all the other bone will just fall off. That is how you preserve the bill of your swordfish. Nice. All right and that's it. Okay, so for today we're going to make a I think it's a swordfish marsala. I don't know what it's actually called but the only place I've ever had it was at the Causeway restaurant in Gloucester, Massachusetts. But uh, we're going to be using some swordfish and uh, before we add the swordfish we're going to make our sauce. And um, I'll show you guys how to make the sauce. Put a bottle of oil in here. I'm going to use Rotel. And um, I use the Rotel because it has chilies added and it gives it a little bit of spice to it. We're gonna add about half a bottle of white wine. This is a Moscato. Um, 
I usually prefer like a, a Chardonnay or something, but this is what I had, but any white wine will work. Some capers. And I'm gonna put the juice from the capers right in there with right in there with the sauce. Artichoke hearts. <laughs> Kalamata olives. Our water is boiling, so we're gonna go ahead and add our pasta. Make a whole bottle of Korea bow tie pasta. Two cloves of garlic. or 15 minutes. We want some of that wine to cook off of there and uh, we want this to blend all together and cook together and just kind of thicken up a little bit and we don't want to put our we don't want to put our swordfish into there yet because if we cook the swordfish for too long what will happen is the swordfish will fall apart. So we want to get the sauce mostly cooked and get it hot and then we're going to chop our swordfish into little small bite-sized pieces and then we're going to put it into the into the sauce okay so here's our swordfish so cubed up into little bite-sized pieces and i'm just going to give this another minute another minute or two to cook down our sauce is getting our sauce is getting to be where it is cooked down and it's nice and hot everything's kind of blended together and uh, we're gonna start adding our swordfish to our sauce deal with this is that we we don't want to overcook the swordfish we just really want to cook it until it's done all the way through so it gets hot all the way through then this will be ready to go our noodles are done go ahead and strain them down So we strained our noodles down. We're just going to pour them right back into this bowl here. Right back into this pan. So 
a lot of people complain that swordfish is too fishy tasting. And so, because it is fishy tasting, a lot of people don't like to eat just plain swordfish. So, that's why we're doing all of this. The sauce is delicious. And, uh, it has a, it has a flavor that kind of balances out the, the strong fishy flavor of the swordfish. Okay. Sauce is done. And with this one we're going to blend the sauce with the, with the pasta before we plate it. Okay, so when we plate this, we're going to take some pasta. Shredded Parmesan cheese. is good to go it's delicious ready to rock and roll right there all right guys thanks for watching